Hello and welcome to Showcase, coming to you from our studios in Istanbul. On today's show, recreating video games from our childhood, but this time with a twist. Also on the program, gender bias in the art world. We'll hear from a top female art executive's point of view. And you'll have to wait until the end of our show if you want to find out about the beautifully melancholic work of Italian painter Matteo Massagrande. But first. Bringing masterpieces to people's fingertips, we look into one artist's mission to make art accessible to everyone. Capturing the sounds of a city, meet the man who sculpts guitars using reclaimed wood from historic New York City buildings. If only the old buildings of New York City could tell the stories they witnessed over the years. Well, they can't literally speak, but they certainly can make music, thanks to guitar maker Rick Kelly. For the past 15 years, he's been using wood that comes from these buildings to shape the most unique instruments. New York City, the ultimate concrete jungle, always under construction. Whenever an old building is being renovated, Rick Kelly is right there to reclaim a piece of history. For him, these are the bones of old New York that he skillfully shapes into guitars in his workshop at Carmine Street. The buildings that I get the wood from are all from the 1800s and earlier. And the wood that frames out these buildings is this old white pine that came from uh, old virgin forest timber and I, because it's the structure of the building, I call it the bones of the building, the bones of old New York. The first batch of wood I got from my friend Jim Jarmish, he's a filmmaker and from his loft uh, they were replacing some of the roof rafters and he offered me the wood. This was uh, I guess around 2004 or 5 I think. Since then, Kelly has gathered enough food to make a few hundred guitars, but he always pays attention when he spots scaffoldings around. Especially if it comes from a historic building, like I've gotten wood from the Chelsea Hotel and from Chumley's, the oldest speakeasy on Bedford Street. And these old buildings, you know, have such stories and the wood is, has uh, a lot to say. You know, God knows what this wood has seen. Uh, Chumley's, you know, was uh, J.D. Salinger and uh, Hemingway and Steinbeck used to hang out there and they'd carve their names in the tables. And so that, that wood is very historical and, and people, sometimes we'll request uh, certain wood from certain buildings. Want a piece of Jimi Hendrix floor in your guitar? You got it. If something comes up where it's a historic building, I don't care if I have no room, I'll make room for it. <laughs> Otherwise, these old pieces of wood are likely to be discarded, mostly because they're full of nails. I have to pull all the nails out of here yet, but that's typical of how many nails there be in each board and a lot of these empty holes where other nails were, so that's why they discard it. Uh, they don't want to have to deal with all those holes. But it doesn't bother Kelly to go through all this process. The perfect wood is worth it. It was really sort of a, a gift. It turned my whole career around because the guitar sounds so good and the wood is so perfect for the instrument. And it's all the same species of Pinostrobus, these big giant white pine trees that were almost 400 years old before they were cut down. Uh, so that I knew this wood would work because it's a perfect wood for solid body electric. You know, you do, you do hear the difference even though it's almost two inches thick. And uh, it's not like an acoustic guitar where the plates and, or a violin where the plates vibrate in unison. On a solid body electric, the whole instrument vibrates, including the neck. And when you use this wood, it makes it vibrate even more and it just offers a lot to the tone. His famous clients like Bob Dylan, Lou Reed, and Patti Smith seem to agree. I always had, you know, an affinity for the music that the New Yorkers like Lou Reed and Patti Smith made, and so I used to listen to a lot of their records. Never in a million years I thought that I'd ever meet them and become friends with them, so it, it's real rewarding. You know. The original inspiration for Kelly, however, was much more the woodwork than the music itself. I started making musical instruments 
was a way to help pay for my college tuition in the early 70s. I got uh, most of my woodworking skills, I guess I inherited from my grandfather. He was a woodworker and he used to build altars for the church and things like that. When I went off to art school, um, I was gonna major in sculpture and I needed some tools. So I asked him if he would give me some of his woodworking tools. So that was the same tools I use today. Everything today is what they call CAD CAM, which means it's controlled by a computer. So all the depth, all the profiling, the bits are all controlled by computer programming. And I don't use any of those. Everything I do has to be uh, uh, an actual template that's screwed to the back of the wood and you follow the template. And because everything is handmade, each guitar is one of a kind. Yeah, I do have the best job in the world. I'm uh, almost 70 years old. Well, I'll be doing this until I can't do it anymore. I love, it's not even a job, it's, it's fun. A starry night sky coming alive with Van Gogh's talented swirls and brushstrokes. Two mythical figures in graphic motif holding each other in Klimt's The Kiss. Or Picasso's brilliant response to the bombing of Guernica. Some paintings not only hit millions of people hard, but they also left an indelible mark on humanity. But what if you can't see any of these artworks? Does it mean you'll never have the opportunity to experience them? Well, one artist in Switzerland is working to make sure this is not the case, one sculpture at a time. Helping blind people see masterpieces might sound like a huge feat to achieve, and it is to some extent, but it's not impossible. Ten years ago, artist Kitre Iturbid embarked on her mission to combat the exclusion of blind people from the world of art by allowing them to discover famous paintings through touch and helping them attach their own meaning to the artworks. The idea is simple. Using clay and glaze, she turns famous artworks like the Scream or Mona Lisa into sculptures. She tries to translate the style of the painter, their techniques, the thickness of the brush strokes, and the different materials. And so far, the feedback has been very positive. I love reinterpreting artworks in three dimensions, even though it's very restrictive because I have to respect the painter. I have to do it in a way that's understandable by touch. I arrived at the end of this project now, and I've learned that all these bas reliefs that I made will be exhibited permanently next to the works in museums, which was my goal from the beginning. Sometimes I'm told that my sculptures are more beautiful than the original paintings. Her work has been exhibited in world-famous institutions like Musée d'Orsay in Paris, where visitors got the chance to touch the 3D version of Van Gogh's self-portrait, right beside the original painting. It orbit feels that these models are works of art by themselves, as they offer an emotional tactile experience, equivalent to what sighted people feel when looking at a painting. You give us an experience of of what um, beauty can be. But how are the 3D technologies changing the way we create and experience art? To answer that question and more, Karina Rodriguez joins me now. She is the principal lecturer at University of Brighton. Karina, we just saw one example, but please tell us more about how 3D technologies are changing the art world. Yes, so 3D technologies are changing um, the art scene today because they offer us a wider variety of options to engage with audiences. So the issue with objects in museums or art galleries is that they are uh, often untouchable. People cannot touch them. They are also very fragile and sometimes they are even inaccessible. So galleries and museums only display a very small percentage of the objects that they actually have in their collections. So 3D technologies give us a wider range of options so that people can access them uh, from creating 3D replicas to maybe just looking at them on the web or on virtual reality experiences. Um, we must not forget 3D copies are not something new. There has been uh, 
since, I guess, w when art started, there has been 3D copies. People have replicated objects. It's only that now new technologies give us a wider uh, options of ways that people might want to engage with these objects. And speaking of these new technologies, I mean, how do they work? What can you do with them? Okay, so the technologies um, uh, work in, in a variety of ways. Some technologies are uh, created from the computer since its inception. So modelers or artists of the computers create uh, shapes that then they can be reproduced by 3D printing. Uh, other options is actually to go and record the physical objects. And again, this process works in, in, in various ways, but it's really similar to photography. When we take a photograph, we are taking one to the image of an object. But when we take a 3D photograph, we just require many to the images of an object that is uh, uh, looking at all the different angles and looking at the object from all different perspectives. And these images and are then uh, uh, brought together in the computer to create a 3D reproduction or a 3D copy, which is a digital model. Now, what are the advantages for blind audiences? So all audiences benefit from these technologies, but blind audiences are particularly uh, beneficiary. And the reason is that the many of the artwork that is available is only experienced by sight, uh, which means that blind audiences don't get to enjoy the artwork. The really good thing about uh, the technologies is that they enable us to reproduce shapes, but we can also manipulate the shapes to make them larger or smaller or differently so that it, they are experienced in better ways by people that are blind. But also, not only they uh, allow us to touch, they can also allow us to smell or to hear, you know, an interpretation of the object or even to taste if we decide to use 3D printing technologies that uh, are done with uh, food-like materials. And what does the future hold for these technologies? So the future, uh, museums are changing because they really want to engage audiences and give access to their collections. So um, in my opinion and in our research, we are finding new ways that uh, audiences would like to engage with uh, objects in museums. That will need that, uh, this will mean that we will need to re-educate audiences somehow to um, uh, make them understand sometimes it's okay to touch, sometimes it's okay to be playful with the artifacts. Um, uh, and enable them to have more intelligent maybe ways to interact with the objects, maybe find things that audiences will be interested to know more about, or have game-like experiences in virtual reality or augmented reality. I think the sky is the limit in trying to find things that people will find interested in one, still having a educational, maybe learning, but enjoying uh, art in the, in the experience. Karina Rodriguez, uh, the principal lecturer at University of Brighton, thank you so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thank you very much. Coming up later on Showcase, a tale of light and shadow. Italian painter Matteo Massegrande channels Marcel Proust as he goes in search of lost time. Breaking up the boys club, women are getting the top museum jobs, but does that mean equal pay? Round one, fight. Cardboard games. We go to Vietnam, where a group of millennials have found a fun way of recycling household waste. As children, we were all given things like popsicle sticks, toilet paper rolls or bottle caps and turned them into pieces of craft style art. Well, now a bunch of adults have taken this skill to a whole new level by creating real versions of iconic video games. Their toys are made up of discarded materials and tweaked with simple electronics. Their creators say that it's a perfect example of how people can help save the planet and have fun doing it. SATA Production is a YouTube channel with more than 66 million views. Its name comes from a play on the Vietnamese phrase for creative. Using materials like bamboo, paper, string and predominantly cardboard, They've been creating tutorials showing people how to be creative with stuff you might normally overlook. 
These materials are something that people throw away after using them. We can recycle them into something interesting, like a game or a toy. And Sata Productions have an added and valuable USP, nostalgia. This Pac-Man video is their most popular to date. It has more than 15 million views, but creating these entertaining videos is no easy task. Getting the ideas for the videos is the stage that takes most of the time. We have to get the idea first, then find suitable materials for our product and modify them in order to have the final game. And these may look like the work of a child, but they're not child's play when it comes to putting them together. There's cutting, soldering and gluing. So they're far more kid-friendly in their finished form. Fight. This Mortal Kombat fighting sim is made using bamboo, a pencil and kitchen foil. The punching and kicking is achieved by some nifty string pullies. They say the videos are able to educate. The production cost is not much. The important thing is we want to do it and send a message to everyone. Our videos are for entertainment as well as for education and people can learn about making games through our videos. With over 70 creative video tutorials on their channel and plans to release more in the coming months, it's safe to say that their creations are not only entertaining their viewers, but inspiring them to look at recycling differently. So the real version of recycled gaming is far from over. While it's women, comprising the majority of museum employees, when it comes to the top positions, most of them are taken by men. And in the case of the United States, white men. But things are changing. In the last year, several institutions, from the Smithsonian's National Air and Space Museum to the National Gallery of Art in Washington, have appointed women to their top posts. But one thing that hasn't changed, gender pay gaps. Washington's wave of female museum leaders marks a milestone in an area that has long been dominated by men. And now it's time to put the gender pay gap issue front and center. According to a survey held by the American Alliance of Museums in 2017, pay gaps are found in just about every institutional position. When it comes to chief curators in particular, men on average are paid around $15,000 more than women. The field's large membership organizations agree that increasing salary reporting transparency is a positive trigger for change. Now, to talk about gender-related dynamics in the art world, we have Mary Turner in our studio. She's the Director of Research and Programs at SALT, an arts and culture incubator based here in Istanbul. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. Thank you for the invitation. So, let's talk about um, gender bias in the art world. As a top executive in a, in, a, in a very important art institution in Turkey, do you still feel like you experience um, gender bias? Well, gender bias, like all biases, I would say, uh, is probably a continuing struggle for all the people who are out there to experience it. Um, within that, uh, specifically, I wouldn't call gender as the only factor that could be part of this struggle as uh, people who are in the culture world reach to higher positions. Um, it is a mix of, I would say, all parts of our identities, all parts that make our identities. And it is a very debated topic uh, within the art world that gender is surely one of the most underlined and emphasized, um, I would say, quality that calls for different types of struggles among professionals, peers, and also within the public. I wonder, from the very first years of your career, did you have to fight, I mean, any sort of cultural gender norms? Like, how did that work out for you, Merit Öner? What if you were a man? How would things work out differently for you? Um, in my perspective, I think I come from a generation uh, who is luckier in the sense that 
these fights have been fought before us. Um, and so personally, I wouldn't identify particular moments in my uh, personal career that would relate to the gender. Uh, but it is obvious that we can only say our capacities can be shown better in environments where the gender norms are not solid uh, to identify positions within any kind of, I would say, environment. And what does it take to fix all these issues and bring on full-on gender parity to the art world? I mean, we know that's cinema world, it, it's in its radar at the moment, uh, gender parity. When will the art world have this and how? Um, well, uh, ideally it needs to start not only at the top, but uh, par gender parity is always synonymous with uh, equal pay. And uh, within that, it's uh, what the cinema world is doing is actually having using their power and visibility to uh, show this to the world. Uh, and it would take similar efforts, I would say, uh, that first of all, we need a certain kind of transparency where we could really see uh, both the number of people who are uh, now working within the cultural sector, but also uh, the way they are cheated in different senses. Uh, so it will probably take some time. And uh, within that time, uh, the, the first steps, I think, are, should be entrusted uh, within the people like myself, who are part of, the, uh, part of this, in a sense, economy, and who have potential to make, uh, even if subtle, uh, changes. Uh, but it needs to be an effort that is taken on by larger numbers of people. And um, before we wrap up, I mean, ageism is another thing I know you wanted to mention. Uh, it comes at play with gender bias as well, doesn't it? Like they sort of go hand in hand. Can you please talk about that a little as well? Having worked in an environment where you get to actually experience the leadership of not only men, but also women, uh, I think it allows you to not be blocked by the idea that there's uh, this uh, norm uh, controlling the actual appointments, let's call it. So uh, age is advantages in this sense, uh, but age also identifies in everyone's mind with experience, um, where I guess is easily, especially in Turkey, the, the, the simplest uh, measure uh, to, in one way or another, qualify people uh, as experts or not. And Therefore bringing respect, of course. Exactly, exactly. It's synonymous with uh, experience and respect in a sense. Thank you so much for joining us today to talk about this very important issue. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation. That wraps up another episode of Showcase. You can check out our YouTube channel for more from the world of art and culture. But before we go, do you remember writer Marcel Proust's famous Madeleine moment? In his magnum opus, In Search of Lost Time, the narrator transported back to his early childhood after taking a bite from the shell-shaped pastry. And it's exactly that magical feeling Italian painter Matteo Massagrande tries to capture in his work. But in his version, the past is hidden not in a bite, but in between walls. I'm Elif Bereketli. Thanks for watching. Bye for now. <laughs>